tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more. Your search is through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. If this is your first time on the Horror Hill, I highly encourage you to go to last week's episode for part one of tonight's tale. Otherwise, welcome back. And now I give you part two and the conclusion of Artyom Darachuk's The Siege of Innsmouth. November 27th, 1928. We finally established a base inside the town's borders. The creatures seem to back off deeper into Innsmouth, and the morale of the soldiers seems to be increasing. It looks like we finally start to get the edge over them, but I still often hear the soldiers whispering and describing the horrors that they've encountered before. Earlier this morning, our captain chose ten men who would venture into the tunnels. Since nobody volunteered, he had to choose them personally. I'm glad that I wasn't one of them. Facing these creatures in the open was terrifying enough, but heading deeper into what could be their nest seemed like insanity. The captain wanted Harrison to accompany them, but his refusal was so loud, violent, and full of fear that the captain had to agree to let him stay before he caused panic among the soldiers. Harrison didn't say what he was so afraid of, since, as it turned out, he didn't know himself, but he claimed that terrible things lived beneath the town, far too terrible to have a name. He shared in privacy from the designated squad that no one of those who had suffered the terrible fate to meet whatever dwelled in those tunnels survived the encounter, and the creature itself was the stuff of rumors, but it was definitely real and it caused houses to rumble as it moved underneath them. I can't even imagine what scary rumors must be shared among those who already lived in this hellhole. The captain made sure to motivate the soldiers well and promised them that all would go fine and they would return safely. But judging by their faces, they were just too depressed from what they'd seen in Innsmouth to make a stand and refuse to go down into the tunnels. None of them believed that they would ever see the light of day again. That said, I must admit that the captain prepared well for the mission. First of all, he told Harrison to indicate on the map of the town locations of all the entrances to the tunnels. 
Those that were the closest to us were blown up with dynamite so that we could no longer fear being surrounded, save for one. In cellars of one of the houses, where we established a small checkpoint. My shift there begins tomorrow, when the soldiers go inside. I must say that while we had all the weaponry we needed to fight back and knew where the enemy would be coming from, it was still unnerving to gaze into the mall of the long corridor in front of us. Every second we expected to see the light of our lamps reflect in the eyes of the dwellers of the deep, or hear shambling of their frog-like feet. One of the soldiers was supposed to carry a radio telephone with him which was connected by the cable to the captain's radio station. Supposedly, it was done so that there was some communication established with them, and so that the captain could guide them, but everyone understood. The radio telephone was just a way for these poor soldiers to feel less alone and surrounded in the tunnels, with the captain's voice lulling their panic. November 28, 1928. Today, the squad of ten went down into the tunnels. I was there along with a few other soldiers to guard the entrance and to serve as reinforcements should such a need arise. By the time the squad arrived, we had been there for a few hours, and while nothing unordinary happened during that time, the sheer pressure of standing near that gateway to the underworld was too much to bear, even compared to the madness-packed, never-ending action of the battlefield. Every second there I was listening to the tune of the howling wind, fearing that it might bring some other sound with it. Sounds that just a month ago I never knew existed. I saw the faces of these soldiers as they were passing me and entering the dark corridor. Some of the faces were scared, others just tired and exhausted by the war. Despite the fact that they were armed to the teeth with each soldier carrying two firearms and two of them struggling with the weight of flamethrowers in their hands, none of them seemed combat ready. After all, even though they had been facing the unspeakable horrors every day, they did so under the open sky. Down below the city, God wouldn't see them. They headed in slowly reluctantly, as if they were hoping that the captain would change his mind. But the old man's face was as cold and emotionless as the walls that surrounded us now. Now that I saw him like that, I knew that he was just following the orders of someone from above. Someone who wouldn't feel the loss of ten soldiers so personally. The first soldier with the flamethrower led the way. With his comrade nearby holding a kerosene lamp to illuminate their path, the one with the radio telephone was in the middle of formation, and the second flamethrower was in the hands of the last soldier. Combined with the rest of the firearms, it seemed that such a formation was nigh vulnerable in the tight confines of the tunnel network. The last soldier went in, and in 30 seconds they disappeared behind the corner. The room was tense, and the only noises we could hear were the screeching of the rotating cable reels as the radio cord was pulled into the tunnel and the careful shambling of their feet that had disappeared after some time. The radio on the captain's table was screeching and wailing with white noise, and sometimes the man pressed the button to speak into the microphone and ask the soldiers about their status. Their replies were short, abrupt, and annoyed. They were scared to death as it was, and would rather remain silent than speak and possibly alert the enemy of their location. More time passed. Everyone was sweaty despite the air in the cellar being rather cold. I caught myself letting go of the rifle to wipe the sweat off my right hand so that the gun wouldn't slip out of my grasp. Some other soldiers were doing the same. The tension was broken when one of the two sounds that lingered in the room vanished. The cable reel stopped squeaking as the cable stopped moving. I heard the soldier next to me inhaling sharply and shifting his position when he raised his rifle and pointed it at the tunnel. The feeling of unrest was quickly spreading among us. What's your status? The captain whispered into the microphone, but no answer followed. His fingers were drumming against the wooden surface of the table as if he was counting the seconds with this simple rhythm, and after a few seconds of silence, he got his reply, faint and trembling. Captain, stay silent. 
such an informal way of addressing your superior wouldn't be tolerated in any other situation, but the captain only started nodding nervously, staring at the radio as if that would help his hearing. There was no doubt. The team encountered something in the tunnels and were doing their best to avoid being spotted. Roughly 30 seconds later, the radio came back to life and the soldier spoke again. The walls around us are covered in something. Something sticky, it's like a slug's trail. Only it's everywhere. The captain kept on nodding for a few seconds, then pressed the button. Trace back to the last safe location. We already did, Captain, the voice replied. This time louder, with trembling notes in it becoming apparent. The soldier was on the verge of breaking down into panic. The slime wasn't here just a minute ago. And now it's here. We're being surrounded by something. Stay on guard, the captain demanded. But when he let go of the button, there was only white noise. The radio was picking up nothing. Do you hear me, soldier? Answer me now, the captain said, pressing the button time and time again. His gaze was full of denial. He refused to accept the fact that ten men that he'd spent on that mission were already gone. Finally, he stopped, and his arms haplessly hung down to the ground. They've cut the cable, he stated calmly, his gaze pointed at the ceiling. Nobody replied. All of us were too shocked to say anything. Losing soldiers at war is nothing uncommon, but all of us had had that faint hope that we would see them again. To have it shattered in just ten minutes was just yet another indication of our enemy's gruesomeness. The silence, however, was broken by a faint screeching sound coming right from the middle of the room. For a few seconds we were startled and disoriented, not able to locate the source of the sound, and I admit that after what we'd just been through I almost succumbed to panic when I heard something so close to me moving. But then I heard one of the soldiers exclaim, The cable! The cable reel was slowly unraveling as the cord was slowly crawling along the floor in the direction of the catacombs entrance, its black insulation steadily merging with the darkness. Something was determined to eradicate all traces of the squad. A moment later, something on the other side of the cord, how far did it stretch? 300, 400 yards? Yanked it with so much force that the reel tumbled over. Still being pulled, it went right past us as if it has some other things to attend to and vanished in the tunnel. The captain had since demanded that the tunnel must be barricaded and guarded around the clock. He decided against sealing it completely with dynamite, probably in case some troopers were still alive and needed a way out. He spared us of the duty of watching the tunnel. Seeing that after what we'd witnessed, we were the last men who would agree to stay there anymore. And it's not just us. I know that many here think about deserting and leaving. December 5th, 1928. I swore to write only about the events that happened here, but I can't keep it in me. I need to share my thoughts and secrets with this paper, for it is the only listener I have here. The war gets stagnant, and that realization scares me. Every day brings new losses, and the most dreadful thing is, I don't see it as something shocking anymore. Even as I write these lines, I can't feel sorrow, I can't feel anger. There are spikes of vigor every time I have to confront a new horrifying enemy, but after that I'm back to apathy, which has already become my common state. The distant gunfire and whistle of mortars does not invoke fear anymore, and the cries of pain and horror of soldiers have replaced the chirping of birds to which I used to fall asleep at home. I know that I'm not the only one like that. We don't discuss it, but I can see it in other men as well. The fire that burned bright in their eyes seems to have faded. The very idea of fighting for the noble cause of humanity's survival appears childish and naive. We fight only for our own survival, 
to see another day because we're not capable of seeing anything beyond that. We face these horrors only to sate the mysterious and unexplainable will to live. There are no humans in this war anymore. Nobody ever leaves the battlefield. The captain saw me write in the diary, but neither of us cared anymore. The loss of those soldiers in the catacombs broke him so thoroughly that he doesn't even seek retribution. He has finally joined our ranks. We keep receiving news from other platoons, and there's some morbid satisfaction in knowing that we aren't the only ones struggling with these spawns of old ages and wizardry. The most standard news are of the soldiers that go crazy during their sleep, and either kill themselves or slaughter their entire squad. There are also descriptions of beasts that go into battle alongside their inhuman masters. Beasts that no human language even has the capacity to describe. On the northern front, where the marshes spread from many miles, our soldiers had to inch through the never-ending fog, where the beasts moved as freely as in the water. It was impossible to see, to anticipate their next move, and every step into the grey unknown could be the last. That front had the most casualties caused by friendly fire. Her soldiers were too exhausted and shot every shadow that moved. Some claimed that they heard muffled screams of their comrades coming from beneath the mud, and indeed many men went missing there. The rumors went that Innsmouth settlers summoned from the caverns deep in the earth's crust some new allies that fled there millions of years ago, never to be touched by the sun's rays, and no one was sure enough to dismiss such stories no matter how ridiculous they were. On the southern front, where the locals concentrated an obscene amount of firepower, the soldiers dug deep trenches to protect themselves from it. The veterans from the Great War, who used to scare new recruits with gory stories of trench warfare in Europe, don't do so anymore, because the new soldiers had already had their share. Catching a bullet to the head while peeking out was considered to be an easy way out. What people really feared was that deep in the night, another wave of frog-legged beasts would find their way inside the dugout labyrinth. And when one of them leaps at you from behind the corner, your choice of weapons is limited to bayonets and shovels. Too many night patrols were found in the morning, mutilated and hanging from the walls, diminished to a pink paste. And too often, they had to be buried right in the walls they were trying to protect. The Navy had it the worst. I don't know how, but the rumors from their front was spreading like wildfire, and as bad as we had it, we couldn't help but still feel sorry for them. The demonic ancestors of the locals and whatever else they brought with them to these lands felt at home the cold, murky waters, and there was nothing the Navy could do to them. One of the ships was thrown onto the rocky coast by a giant tidal wave that appeared out of nowhere. Another ship simply vanished pulled into the depths by some quiet, unseen force. The command sent a submarine to search for it in order to identify the assailant, but when the submarine surfaced, all of the crew was dead, killing themselves in a surge of insanity. The walls were smeared in blood and some cryptic writings. After a few more people went crazy from looking at them, it was decided that it was better to sink the submarine along with its contents. The captain says it will soon be over, that we're encircling the enemy and soon they'll have nowhere to run, but the harder we push, the more they resist. The deeper we advance into the city, the more madness we unravel. I fear that by the time we reach their stronghold at the Marsh Mansion, there will be no human capable to face the evils they'll throw at us. Entry Date Unknown I'm not sure how we're still alive. Truly, it is a miracle that I face the evils deep beneath the town without losing both my life and sanity. Though I have nothing to be glad about, any hour now I might lose both. As I write these notes, I'm being kept in a cell somewhere underneath the town. Maybe I'm under the Marsh Mansion, maybe somewhere else. Others here are worried that we might not even be in the States anymore, that the creatures had carried us to some unknown labyrinths underneath the ocean. 
but occasionally the sounds from the outside find their way into these tunnels. I hear explosions of the artillery, and I hope to hear gunshots soon. Those sounds of war are the only threat of hope we have. A hope that keeps us from strangling ourselves or bashing our heads against the walls. Because even these cells collapse under the artillery bombardment that is still a fate better than whatever the locals have in stock for us. Initially, there were eight of us in these cells. We were locked up separately, but we could speak through the locked doors to each other. We didn't discuss the situation we were in. There was nothing we could do about it anyway. Instead, we were talking about our past, before the campaign, taking turns. We were discussing the girls who were waiting for us at home. We shared fond memories of our friends. We listened, holding our breaths when a former farm boy was trying to pick the right words to describe the precise taste of the apple cider he and his brother loved so much. As those creatures opened his cell and were carrying him away for some purpose I didn't want to even think about, he was still recounting how the apple cider was made and what made it so special for him. Till the very end, he was trying to escape to the better times. I try not to think about what happens to those who are taken away. The unknown rituals happening above scare me witless, and when we hear the croaking, chanting, we raise our voices. I try to be hopeful, if only because I have nothing else to do. But still, if I knew that I would end up in this cell, if I had known where these tunnels would have led me, I'd stayed and fought with my comrades till the end. I would try to hold the line. On the morning of November 29th, our camp was attacked by those croaking creatures. They assaulted us from all sides, leaving nowhere to fall back. Their inhuman voices were getting into our heads, making it hard to think and turning us on each other, and their numbers increased with each second as unimaginable phantoms and apparitions were popping into reality, drawn to our world by their assailant's command. Their attack was desperate. A last-ditch attempt to squeeze us out of the lands they'd claimed. But it was working. It was hard to pinpoint where they were coming from and where to run. They were everywhere, and all of us were on our own. Even thinking about maintaining formation in that chaos was suicidal. All we were thinking about was survival. I'm glad to say that I start to forget everything that I'd seen take place there. My memory had mercy on me and spared me from the gruesome, core-shaking details of that day. Back then I was thinking with perfect fear-induced clarity, but now my mind has ditched it so that I could live on, untainted by the trauma. I can remember that my legs led me to the very same cellar with the barricaded entrance to the tunnels. A few soldiers and Henry Harrison were with me, and that was where we intended to take our last stand. Every time some unspeakable monstrosity appeared in the doorway at the top of the stairs, we shot it without thinking, without giving in to its insane ramblings. They were agile, and their hide was tough, but the narrow stairway left them with no room to maneuver. But as we were fighting on, we could hear less and less gunshots coming from above. We could hear the screams of the soldiers above ground drowned out in a cacophony of hell that was unleashed above us. We could hear their bones snap and the hissing of air escaping their lungs through new holes. We knew that we had only so much ammunition. One soldier rushed toward the barricade behind us and grabbing the crowbar from the table next to it started tearing it down. Another one joined him, and together they started making a lot of progress. No! Henry shouted towards them, not taking his eyes off the doorway in front of him. You have no idea what's in there. Stay here. Despite his warnings, a third soldier had abandoned his post and started tearing into the wooden planks of the barricade with his bare hands. With a careless movement, he tore one of his nails out when his hands slipped, but that didn't stop him. To him... The dank unknown of the tunnels was the only way out, his only salvation. A minute later, they made an opening just wide enough to squeeze into it one man at a time. The first soldier dove in without thinking. 
The other one grabbed the lamp from the table nearby first and only then followed. His comrade was pushing him in the back, trying to force him through. We're leaving, Henry, I shouted to the young man, but he just shook his head. I'll stay here and cover you. You don't have to be a hero, we can all escape, I pleaded, but he shook his head again. You have no clue what's in there. It's better to die to these things than face what dwells beneath Innsmouth. Farewell, soldier. He gave me a quick pat on the shoulder before turning towards the stairway and raising his rifle. It was clear that he wouldn't go, and if I stayed and tried to convince him, I'd just die along with him. Saluting to his bravery, I jumped through the opening in the barricade and ran into the tunnels, hoping that the rest of the soldiers didn't go too far. Henry's last cry, echoed all the way to our position, was not that of horror, but of rage and fury. He spent his last seconds fighting the abominations that took away his hometown and even his family. The only thing they couldn't take away was his indomitable will. At that time, however, we weren't in the mood to mourn him. It's a shameful thing to admit, but all we were focused on was getting as far away as possible from the creatures that slayed him. I thought about sharing Henry's last warning with the rest of the soldiers, but then decided against it. All of them were already on the verge of mental breakdown, and if I were to tell them that Henry refused to go here because he feared something even more horrifying than what we'd faced before, there was no saying how they'd react. At first, we weren't thinking where we were going. We just wanted to cover as much distance as possible. Then, it became painfully clear that we weren't even sure which direction to move in. Not that it mattered, the tunnels didn't have any logic to them. They could go straight in one direction for hundreds of yards and then branch out into four more. We were afraid of meeting the inhuman enemies there, but strangely it seemed that the tunnels were devoid of them. There wasn't a single sound apart from our footsteps and tired breathing. Walking around aimlessly, we reached another intersection. One of the tunnels was wider than the others and was going upward at a slight angle. Thinking that it could be our way out, we decided to investigate. My eye caught something glistening in the light of a lamp on the walls and floor twenty yards from where the tunnel started. At first, I didn't give it much attention, but as we approached it closer, I realized that the whole tunnel was covered in a thick layer of some slime. The further the tunnel went, the thicker the layer was, oozy and transparent. It reminded me of a trail that a snail leaves behind. Walking a bit closer, we noticed that the tunnel didn't go very far. Roughly twenty yards from where we stood, the tunnel was cut off by a wall of what seemed like dirt. Back then, we thought that the tunnel caved in, but then one of the soldiers noticed that the strange slimy substance was oozing from the dirt wall. His words reminded me of something. The squad that had gone missing in those tunnels a few days earlier reported seeing the same slimy substance around them just before the connection with them was lost. I shouted that we had to go immediately, but at that point it was already too late. We were already too close. The slimy wall suddenly started shifting, and from the depths of whatever substance it was made of emerged a large, bulbous eye, as wide as a human is tall. It examined us for a few seconds, shifting its gaze from one soldier to another, as if counting us, and then, without any warning, it opened up, tearing in half and exposing countless teeth inside its eyeball. The whole creature started shifting towards us, growing many smaller eyes around its impoverished maul to see where to go. Nothing had ever invoked such dread in me as the sight of that monstrosity approaching. It was all engulfing. Unstoppable. Like a landslide that was too close to escape, as if the very tunnels themselves decided to purge us from their insides. We ran. We ran without looking back. I heard someone slip in the ooze it had secreted and I didn't even turn around to see who it was. It didn't matter. I was sure that I'd join the poor soul soon, but regardless of that, I kept running. 
It didn't matter if the tunnels were thin or wide, the creature never slowed down its advance. I could hear it shriek in many different voices, and sometimes what started as a growl would end as a squeal. It was changing its form as it went, morphing and changing, trying to become the most optimal version of itself, a version that would eventually catch up to us. The tunnel in front of us made a fork. A soldier that was running in front of me turned right, and for some reason I decided to turn left. Judging by the footsteps behind me in the sudden darkness, I realized that I was all on my own. Everyone else turned right. I kept running, hoping that at least the rest of them would escape while the creature maimed me. But, apparently, the creature made a different call than I'd expected. Instead of going for me, a seemingly easy prey in my blindness, it decided to chase the rest of them. I was charging forward into the darkness and all I could hear behind me was the never-ending rumbling as the creature's endless body moved past my tunnel. I was running completely blind to the world around me. I didn't know where I was, where my comrades were, where the enemy was, where was my left, my right, up and down. I didn't even know why I was running anymore. I didn't know how much time had passed. With pitch blackness enveloping me, Cut off from the rest of the world, I was left eye to eye with the only feeling that was engulfing me. Terror. It's hard to tell how much time I'd spent in that state. I don't know what really happened and what I'd imagined. I don't know if I was sleeping or roaming around in the dark. I just know that the walls of the cell I'm in was the first thing I focused my eyes on when I came to my senses. Maybe I was lured there. Maybe they brought me. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. They're coming. Maybe they're coming for me. If somebody finds this, I want you to know. I've tried. I've tried saving us all. December 23rd, 1928. The war is over. I'm writing this from a military base where all the survivors were brought in. There are hundreds of us, though there should have been thousands. Nobody here knows what's going on and how long are we going to be kept here, but at the very least I was told that the war is over. And even that sweet moment of victory is being taken away from me by the uncaring reality. We didn't win. We didn't eliminate the enemy. They just withdrew all of their forces, vanished back into the depths that had spawned them. We didn't wipe them all out. We just fought back a piece of our land, a piece that is going to be destroyed anyway. We are told that the town of Innsmouth is going to be destroyed, its very existence wiped from the records. We are also told that we must all keep our mouths shut or we're going to swiftly end up in an insane asylum. Not that we're not going to end up there anyway. The things we've seen are... impossible to forget. To ignore. I'm doing my best to hold up, to appear sane, just so that I'm not erased from the records as well. Troublesome soldiers keep disappearing at night and being taken away somewhere from where there is no return. I think it's only our sacrifice for the country that keeps the high command from just gassing us all. After all, we're the last thread that leads to Innsmouth. We are the few people who can verify that it ever existed. The preparations will be made, that's for sure. The conspiracy of the highest level of secrecy weaved into existence to hide the fact that we're not the owners of our planet. New weapons will be forged, far more powerful than anything humanity has ever wielded. Perhaps we'll even try to leave the planet and settle on the moon, like in those sci-fi stories. We better hurry up, because our enemy is strong. He's seen what we're capable of. He'll gather his forces. The next time he attacks, it won't be a war. It will be extermination. If you're reading this, 
I'm sorry. I've tried to give you a better future. We've all tried. The Siege of Innsmouth was written by Artyom Derechuk. Artyom Derechuk is an English-speaking Ukrainian writer who lives in Moscow, Russia. Drawing inspiration from his post-USSR environment and mythology of numerous peoples that live there, Derechuk aims to craft the most intricate, spine-chilling, and bizarre stories that he can. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh. And if you could, please leave a kind word, or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening. Good evening.